All right, guys, now we're live. Um, I'm sitting here talking to Gina today. I've known Gina for a few years now, and uh, we were just kind of recapping her personal development journey over the last few years. I was saying how, how much she's done. We're going to talk about health and fitness and mindset and money and how she's just really like a, a go-getter, a goal setter and a goal crusher. Like she's just out there doing the things. And I don't know um, if any of the listeners know you personally or not, but we can get into this in a minute. One thing that I've always admired about you, Gina, is um, how much of a go-getter you are at such a young age. Like I looked at myself when I was your age and I'm sure you get this a lot where you're like, stop telling me how fucking young I am. Cause I remember when people used to say that to me, it would just irk me, but like, really you are so ahead of the game. And it just, it makes me smile every time I see you doing something because I'm like, man, there's like 40, 50 and 60 year olds that don't have the emotional intelligence or the mindset skills that you have at such a young age. And it just makes me smile knowing like where you are going to go with those skills. So now my husband's creeping up on me trying to make me laugh. I told, I told Gina before we started recording, I had to go hide out in my truck because my kids were screaming in the house. Um, but anyways, enough of me talking. Gina, how about you go ahead and introduce yourself and then uh, we'll kind of talk about your story. Okay. Um, first of all, I love that. Um, I actually <laughs> love when people talk about like that I'm a go-getter at such a young age because I never thought about it like that. Um, I've always just thought about like, once you get out of high school, you have to just go, go, go until you get to where you want to be. And I'm slowly learning that you don't want to just go, go, go. Um, so anyway, I'm 22 to answer the question of how young are you? <laughs> and I just, well, we'll graduate from Briarcliff in September since I couldn't because of COVID with my bachelor's degree in kinesiology and human performance. So I've always had an interest in like the health and wellness, but it was always just health and fitness, not like wellness as in your mental capacity and taking care of yourself mentally and being where you want to be and being able to pour into other people. So like you said, with starting my personal development journey, I've kind of poured into that even more and learned where that's more important than your health and fitness in a way, because you can't really prioritize your health and fitness if you aren't in a mental place that's good, if that makes yes. sense. No, it makes perfect sense. And I remember talking about this because a lot of times, and, and you know, it's very interesting, um, the mindset piece of it too, because there's people out there, and maybe you can attest to this, that do the quote unquote, you know, exercise and eat healthy, but they still feel like shit. And it's because they're not taking care of like their, their mental or emotional or spiritual side of, you know, their spiritual health, if that makes, if that makes sense. <laughs> For sure. And I think like, no matter how healthy you eat, if you're not like, like happy about that food and you're just having a negative emotion towards that food, you're not going to feel good inside anyway. Like, I don't know if that actually makes sense, but it does because what we think about food is a huge thing. So, and that's where people start to, um, you know, they starve themselves or if they eat too much, they purge or they, um, say, Oh, well, I'm using this as a treat meal or I'm, you know, and it's like, well, food isn't it. I guess in an animalistic sense, you could use food as treats because that's what I do with my dogs to like motivate them to do things or my horses to motivate them to do things. But I don't know if that's a healthy mindset for humans, you know, to, to um, have like a, oh, I can only have a chocolate cake if I like work my ass off. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I'm one of those people where if I'm like, I cannot have cake and I'm not allowed to eat this, I will spiral and eat like half the cake seven pieces of chocolate and six fruit snacks in an hour. Six fruit snacks. <laughs> oh, the fucking fruit snacks. My kids are like obsessed with fruit snacks. I don't even know how they got started on it. Um, but no, I totally agree. And, and I have been talking to a friend of mine um, about what we call healthy indulgences, right? And so you can indulge on cake every freaking day if you wanted to. Just modify what that cake looks like. And you can make cake with zero to no sugar or alternatives that are that are healthy for you or you can just have like one or two bites instead of one or two pieces there's there's ways to indulge still um that aren't going to hurt you mentally physically emotionally all of those different ways so let's let's take a step back what 
inspired you to start on your health and fitness journey? I know when we first started talking, you, um, you were in school, I think you were doing Beachbody, um, but what, what kind of inspired you to take that route into, you know, human performance, kinesiology, things like that, and, and even um, the, the side job that you have now? So originally I decided kinesiology and human performance because when I was young, I had to go through physical therapy and I fell in love with the aspect of um, like just taking care of yourself and the way the human body can heal itself is incredible. Mm -hmm. Um, So that just fascinated me. And then uh, kinesiology and human performance just seemed like the right route to go. And even though I was taking all those classes and learning how you needed to take care of your body and how it was important. I was the kid in college living off of ramen noodles, fruit snacks, and binge watching Netflix in my bed. Like the idea of going to the gym was not an okay thing for me because there was people there. I don't like people. Oh, I didn't know that. I mean, maybe I did, but okay, keep going. And then um, my mom actually went through some health issues and she decided that she wanted to have Um, go through a process to lose weight and just get back to where she wanted to be taking care of herself. And I knew that she was going to need support. And I knew that support support was going to come from me because it always has. I've just kind of like been there to encourage my mom with everything. And so I was like, I need to make a different change if I'm going to expect her to hold on to her change. So that's kind of when I dove into Beachbody and doing the workouts and just kind of making a change in myself. Um, And then it wasn't till like a month or so later that I figured out like personal development and growth in that, that way. So when you first started Beachbody, what did you think of that? I thought it was great because I could work out in my living room. And mind you, at this point, I was living in a dorm with three other girls. So our living room was probably the size of like some people's master bathrooms and we had a couch, a futon, a desk and a table and a chair in there. So I would just shove everything to the side and have this little like six by three foot area to work out in and it worked. (laughs) And I would wake up early before, I also was not a morning person, but I would wake up early before going to anatomy and work out. And some days it works. Some days I hit snooze about 700 times. And I'm sure Kylie, who was living in the room with me, wanted to punch me in the head every morning. (laughs) But it just worked for me. So how long before you started to notice uh, results, whether it was how you felt or physical? Um, It was honestly within like a week or so when I was doing the workouts consistently. Because for a while I did, like, it was every other day or occasionally but once I started doing it consistently and eating something other than pop tarts and fruit snacks it was almost right away like I noticed more energy um I could focus better and yeah I don't know what it is about college but I lived off of pop tart pop tarts and diet mountain dew or pop tarts and red bull and I I feel you with the ramen thing too it must just be a college thing (laughs) (laughs) all right so how did but the worst thing for you. Yeah. Oh my God. I know there's like so much like sugar in pop tarts and there's like ridiculous amounts of sodium in, uh, ramen noodles. Like I'm pretty sure you might as well just eat like a salt brick and call it good. Like, and throw a bunch of artificial shit on there too. But, um, anyways, that's neither here nor there. Yes. (laughs) So, okay. So how did you end up, um, on the personal development journey then? What was kind of like your first, uh, intro into that? So with Beachbody, um, my coach kind of like talked about it and said, Hey, you need to work on this. Um, but then I guess I don't really know where it actually took off. I don't know if it was working with you or if it was prior to that, but I got like a morning routine and Rachel Hollis, wonderful human being with the five with her, like start to day journal. I never actually bought five. Oh, okay. I never actually bought one, but I listened to, she has a podcast where she actually like breaks it down and I listened to that. And so I just do that in my journal all the time. But so that, and then like reading stuff and I don't know, 
it just kind of spoke to me once I actually started doing it. I don't know when I started. I feel like I've been doing it forever and it's only probably been like two years. <laughs> I know, but that's kind of how it goes. And then like the more you do it, the more you get into it. And then you're like, Ooh, I wonder what I can do next. And it just mm -hmm. kind of becomes like, um, an exciting way to, to challenge yourself. So, all right. Um, so during your personal development journey, when did you start to make the shift from, Oh my gosh, I need to, you know, up my game or challenge myself or take better care of myself? Like what was some of the big reasons that you, you started personal development and, and what was the big things that have stuck with you? I've never really thought about that. <laughs> I don't know. Just the getting out of my own head. I think that helped a lot because I, when I first started personal development, I started with journaling and I started with reading like a chapter out of a book and reading, I would zone out and space out, whatever, but I'd still get something from it. And then I'd go to journaling and I'd have like three pages of just stuff that I was dealing with anxiety about and stressed about and didn't feel like I could talk to anybody about but just writing it down and doing like a total brain dump got it out of my head. So I think that's where I like really fell into personal development and realized, Hey, this is not a bunch of woohoo crap where you're just putting something on paper. It's actually great crap where you're putting something onto paper and getting it out of your head because our brains only can store so much before they go into overdrive. So let's talk about that. What did that look like for you? I know you talked uh, uh, briefly about like anxiety and things, but tell us kind of your, your story with that. So I've dealt with anxiety and depression for a long time. Um, my dad passed away when I was 10. And from then on, I think just life experiences and trying to be there for my family, I pushed everything down and I ignored everything. And so like it eventually just welled up as anxiety and depression and I never knew how to deal with it so I was just medicated. Um, I don't remember when I started getting medicated for anxiety but it was sometime like probably around freshman year of high school and I was just medicated from it all the time and I didn't know any different. Um, so <clears throat> then I started to journal about it and write what was stressing me out and just getting that out i think even though it had been let's see you're a freshman when you're like 16 and it had been probably 10 years since my dad had passed away i still felt some of that coming up and i still noticed some of that being put on paper and so i think all of that like getting it out and reliving it i guess per se helped me get past a lot of stuff in the past so I was able to work past my anxiety instead of just ignoring it. I think that I feel, yeah. And, and my experience and just from working with um, other clients too, is a lot of times anxiety, overwhelming uh, emotions come up from shoving things deep, deep down and not bringing them to surface and allowing you to process them effectively. So for example, like me, one of my underlying emotions is always anger. And if I don't process my anger, as soon as it comes up, I shove it down, shove it down, shove it down, shove it down. Well, then I'm going to explode at some given time. And it may be somebody drops a piece of cereal on the floor and it just sends you over the edge and you have that like snap, right? Yes. And it's just, it's that one, it's that, what do they say? The straw that broke the camel's back or whatever. Yes. Um, and that's what happens. You know, you explode, you're a volcano, you erupt and whoever is around you at that given time gets all of the blah that's coming out of you. Um, mm -hmm. and, and sometimes we feel like, oh, there's something wrong with me. I shouldn't feel like this. And this happened so long ago, but it doesn't matter because if that emotion and that energy doesn't if you don't process that, if you don't allow that to move through you, it will become stuck. And then um, this is just my take. I'm not a doctor. I'm not anything like that. But um, from the energetic side, the spiritual side, if you medicate that on top of that energy being stuck in you, you're just numbing it, right? It's like throwing band-aids on top of it and not really like healing the wound every time you... <laughs> 
rip it off. It's like, it's still right there, right? You need to like process it, allow it to breathe, allow it to heal. And then there, a scar will form and then you'll be able to talk about it. Just like a physical scar on your body, right? Like if you keep scratching at a bandaid, scratching at a banding, the, the wound is never going to get better. You can shove whatever you want on top of it. It's never going to get better kind of thing. But if you allow it to like breathe and heal and things like this, you can look at it and be like, oh yeah, there was a scar. And that was at a point in my life. And I have a story to tell behind it and I'm okay to talk about it now. Yeah. For sure. And I definitely think that like looking back now, I can tell where that anxiety medication was just numbing what mm -hmm. I felt because I was also on medication for ADHD then. And I would, between the two of them, I literally told my best friend one day, I need you to shut up because you're annoying the hell out of me. And I looked at her the next day and I'm like, I am so sorry. I think it's like a complication between my meds. And that is like one thing that has stuck with me. I'm pretty sure it was my junior year of high school and it still bothers me to this day. That's so interesting. Isn't that so, it's just so funny how we remember details like that in our life. And it's, it's not necessarily like what happened. It's like how it made you feel. And that feeling has stuck with you. Yes. Mm. So crazy. So are you, and maybe this is too personal of a question, you don't have to answer this, but um, I'm going to ask it anyways. <laughs> so are you still taking medication or have you um, been able to kind of heal yourself in a holistic sense or where are you at with anxiety, depression, and, and kind of that now? Um, I am not medicated for anxiety, depression, or ADHD in, anymore, um, which makes me really happy to say, but I've through like journaling and breath work and um, like asking myself stuff, I've gotten past needing my medication for anxiety and depression. Um, and then my ADHD, I've figured out like block work and that helps me focus a lot better. Um, so like with my anxiety, one thing that I'll ask myself a lot is, is this real? So if I'm in a situation like, actually, we'll just say before this podcast, because I was nervous as shit. Um, How do you feel now? <laughs> no, keep going. I could feel like the anxiety building and I could feel myself being like, well, what if this happens? Well, what if it sucks? What if, what if I say this? And I'm like, well, those are all what ifs. If it's not happening right here and right now, and I can't like physically feel it. And there's a, like a real reason for me to be feeling it. Why am I feeling it? Why am I stressing and sweating about something that's not here yet? And I know everybody's anxiety is different and the way they cope with it is different. And sometimes I have to do brain dumps and sometimes it's just asking myself, but finding those cues is what's gotten me off my medication. Interesting. And I know that doesn't apply to everybody. Mm -hmm. um, there are certain individuals who, you know, they do have chemical imbalances in their brain. And that's why people, you know, they have certain medications to help heal people. Or maybe it's a, a bridge between where you are now and where you want to be. And, and maybe there's just certain steps that you take to, to heal yourself from the inside out. I mean, everybody's a little bit different. Um, so anybody listening to this who's like anxious or depressed, like don't just like randomly stop taking your medication. <laughs> like, yeah, no. I definitely worked up to the point where I, I felt comfortable. Don't just, I don't know, throw them in the trash because that is not a good idea. No, and a lot of those drugs can be uh, addictive in a sense. So you can go through like some serious withdrawals if you just all of a sudden like stop taking that medication. So um, if you are looking to, you know, wean yourself off of any type of medication, um, you know, make sure to talk to your doctor or some type of um, – What's the word I want to look for? I'm, I was going to say holistic nutritionist, but I think I'm looking for a different word. Um, like a holistic doctor. What is the word? I'm losing my mind. Anyways, doesn't matter. Work with somebody in the professional field, but also like, it's okay. Like it's baby steps. Like you don't have to just like all or nothing, like all oh, tomorrow I'm going to be off all my meds. Um, things don't flip switches like that. Everything's definitely uh, micro baby steps, action steps every day. 1% um, better. That's all you got to hope for. Um, so, okay. So 
you talked about breath work. I want you to talk about that a little bit. How, how did that help you? And what do you do for that now? Um, I started with square breathing, I believe. Yay! <laughs> and I don't know, I turned to that a lot. Um, square breathing, meditation, and diaphragmatic breathing are like my best friends. Um, so tell me what those are. And for our listeners, explain, explain what your process is and what that means. So square breathing is you kind of like, I always visualize a box. I guess you don't necessarily have to, but I do. And uh -huh. you inhale through your nose for four seconds and then hold that for four seconds, exhale for four seconds, and then hold that for four seconds and then repeat. And that just basically sends a signal through your body. Um, it's like a calming signal. Can't remember uh -huh. what the technical term or whatever but it just allows your body to take a time to calm down and yeah so that's helped a lot in like when i'm in certain instances or when i can feel the anxiety or anything building up um and it's a very discreet way to do it um so that's helped me a lot especially like in classes or if i have to be in front of people or a new situation um, so then diaphragmatic breathing has helped me a lot with healing over IBS. And that's just literally breathing down into your stomach. Um, so your diaphragm is lower in your abdomen. And when you inhale, a lot of people only inhale into your chest. Um, but when we're babies, if you watch a baby breathe, they breathe into their stomach. Mm -hmm. And so that also is a, a calming signal to your body that you're safe and that your fight or flight signal does not have to be go or your yeah fight or flight signal doesn't have to be going. You can be in like a rest and digest type of situation or um, feeling in your body. Hope that makes sense. No, it does, and it's true. If you look at kids, I mean, I have two young kids. Um, and they do, they all, they all belly breathe. And they even tell you that like, oh, if to watch for their breathing, you know, you don't really look for their chest. You look for their, their diaphragm, their stomach area. And that's what, um, and it's so funny because we're born with these skills, yet our society, our culture and, and history, time, all these things condition us to forget what that is. And we start this chest breathing and, and we start to feel the anxiety and things like that. And when you're tense, you do, you, ch you chest breathe. It's different. Um, but even like, and maybe you can talk about this with like the, the, um, kinesiology, human performance, uh, things like that. Like even children, like us as adults, we're lazy. How many people do you know that like bend over at the hips to pick something up and then they're like, Oh, my back. Oh, whoa. but if you watch a kid, they squat, you know, like, I love <laughs> or when they go to take a poop, they squat, like, if, you know, they, they have like actual like their innate skills, innate ability to use their body, how it's supposed to function, which promotes like health and healing and, and the way that it's supposed to move versus like us now, we're always looking for like shortcuts that we end up straining and hurting ourselves. Yes. And I love that you talk about that because we actually just talked about that in class. Like the proper way to bend and lift things was the topic today. So. So let's talk about it because I'm sure everybody's like, what is she talking about? But if you ever look at like a kid, they do, they squat to pick something up. Every, mm -hmm. every child I know squats to pick something up and then all of a sudden they become school age and it's like weird to squat. So then everybody like bends over to like take a shortcut and then ends up like throwing a disc or they like strain their neck or they sleep funny or something like that. So what did, what did you learn about this though? I'm, I'm curious. We kind of just talked about the ba the different types of lifting. So there's like a deep squat lift. So you, for that, you have something where you're basically straddling it and then you do a squat to lift it. Um, or the traditional lift is where you're lifting something that's no lower than your knees, um, but you're still using your legs to lift it because like everybody um, not everybody, but most of our society will just bend at their waist and lift no matter what it is, no matter how heavy it is. Mm -hmm. And that puts so much strain on your low back and your hips and, and your shoulders. Like it just throws everything out of alignment. And if you're lifting improperly, 
you're putting too much strain on different parts of your body. And like you said, you're going to end up with like a bulge disc or um, just different parts of your body where they're going to hurt. And then you're going to compensate. And so then mm -hmm. your knee's going to hurt because your back hurts and it's just a whole, a whole ordeal. But I don't know. There's a lot in like nature versus nurture that I think our society has like gone away from the nature form. Yes. And, and oh, I, I mean, we could talk about this for hours too. And I feel like it's that with everything in our lives though, you know, um, I feel like we're conditioned at a very early age to, to question what we feel is innately true for us or speaking our truth. And you know, what else just came to me is just us having this conversation, right? Um, I don't think you would have done this with me two years ago. You would have been scared shitless and been like, Hey, I don't, I don't know what I have to say. And, but like trusting your gut and that like, it's all going to be okay. And just like sharing the knowledge that you have, like the a level of confidence that you have in yourself um, has, and I know it's totally off topic, but it's just like skyrocketed and it's, it's totally awesome. Um, but I'm sure that also goes into other areas of your life too, where you found that like you're more confident in, in your, you know, your physical health or your emotional health or your personal development. And those areas of your life are working in alignment with one another, similar to your spine. And I tell people this all the time, like you have different areas of your life. If one thing's out of whack, you're going to feel it in all other areas. Like you said, you're going to compensate or you're going to like shove it down, pretend everything's okay. But really, if you just you know, trust your gut and do the, do the thing the way that your intuition or, or nature in a sense, um, has intended for you to do, then you're going to be better off and everything's going to be like a well-oiled machine and all working together with one another. Yes. I love that. I've never actually like thought of life as like a spine and how it all the parts have to be in alignment for it to work properly, but that's so true. It is. I tell people that all the time. Like if you have one vertebrae out of alignment on your back. So for example, let's, let's take the squat thing and, and people really do well with visuals. I know, like you said, like, Oh, a box breathing. I visualize a box. I'm that same way. Like I need to have like a visual in order for like my brain to like grasp it. And then I put it into this like little imagery bank in my brain. And I'm like, Oh yeah, that's right. That means this. Mm -hmm. Um, so for example, if I feel off in an area of my life, if I'm like, Oh, this isn't working it will trigger me right in other areas of my life. And so what I mean by that is if you have your spine and one vertebrae is, um, I don't know, bulged or out of place or out of whack. And you feel that throughout your whole body. I don't know anybody who's tweaked to their back and been like, Oh God, I'm fine. Like it's fine. Like everything's fine. I mean, they'll probably say that, but like, you can't truly feel fine. Like you can't lift, you can't turn, you can't, you really can't go throughout your day without thinking about the pain that you're in. And it's the same thing with your life. If you have a job that you hate, a lot of times you bring that hate home and you're pouring into your family from an empty cup because you're drained from hating your job all day. Or if you feel physically um, out of shape or you're not eating, well like that can trigger into your energy levels too and you're still not giving your your best self to to yourself and to others it starts to drain into other areas of your life but if you start to look at your life um from a physical emotional spiritual financial career driven standpoint and everything's kind of working in alignment with one another you feel good and isn't that like the purpose of life is to feel good to to enjoy living to have a little fun along the way Yes, absolutely. And I feel like you can even like take it to the point of looking at like um, pain medication as mm. like your, the pain medication is just there to block that signal. And then if you just take everything that you're feeling and shove it down or like turn to emotional eating, which I do all the time, it's like a pain medication for that thing that's not in alignment. Yeah. So let's talk about emotional eating. Um, I used to do that too, where I'm like, or, or I'm that person, um, if I get started on like snacks, it's like, I don't have an off switch. Right. So I'm that person that like, if you give me like chips and guac, like, Oh, see you later bag of chips. Or if they're mm -hmm. like, Oh, here's this, uh, package of a fun share size M&M &M bag or whatever. And it's like, Oh, serving size is six pieces. I'm like, Oh, well give me 60. Like I just, I have a hard time with that off switch when I get going. Um, which I mean is one of my triggers. So I, I'm better off just to avoid those things, but, um, they can be emotional triggers for me. And I, I've, I used to eat my feelings. I'm much better about it now. Um, I used to really drink my feelings was probably the big thing that I did. So 
But let's hear about your emotional eating journey. I'm slowly getting better, but I will not say that I'm very good at it because like I am definitely a stress eater. Um, if I feel any form of stress, I, I am also going to turn towards chips, like chips and salsa. Oh, oh, love that. We better never be crying in the same room or we're just going to, I'm going to drink lots of beer and I'll bring the chips and salsa. <laughs> Are you sure we better never be or should we schedule that? <laughs> Maybe we'll just have to schedule that. <laughs> we'll call it a cheat day. No, I'm just teasing. Oh, <laughs> Anyways, continue. <laughs> Um, no, I used to like, if you gave me a bag of chips or a bag of M&Ms, I would sit there and eat the entire thing. And mm -hmm. for a while I was really good about it. But then I started working at a job where one of my friends always had candy and she's like, you can always take my candy. It's fine. And I'm like, well, that was a bad permission to give me. Cause then the minute I would get frustrated at work, I'm like, all right, where's the snacks? Mm -hmm. <laughs> or somebody would piss me off or I'd come in from a bad day at school. And now I've learned to, one of the things that I've started doing is turning to water instead of food. Um, so that's helped because it's easier to feel bloated from water than feel bloated from that entire bag of chips. Um, yeah, for sure. And I haven't really figured out a lot of ways to get past my trigger of emotional eating. I'm still working on that a lot. Um, but not having those, not having the resources, because I don't like to have a lot of food in our house, even though my mom loves to buy like the good food. I try mm -hmm. to ignore it. So it's not even there. So what I did to help with my emotional eating, and maybe this will help you, maybe it won't. Um, well, there's a couple different things that I did. But when I wasn't triggered, and I knew that I would like the places that I would go when I was triggered, I would put like post it notes on the bags and say, Do you need this right now? Why do you want this right now? And I'm like, Is it? Is, and it would make me, it was enough to make me stop and think, like, Is this an emotional choice or am I like actually hungry or like, Why am I going after this? And it was just enough to make me stop and think and be like, Okay, do I still want to do this or not? And then, um, <laughs> even then, sometimes I would put like, how do you want to feel on the bag? And a lot of times I'm like, oh, you know, fuck you, Sasha. Like, why did you make me trick myself? <laughs> because how you feel after, like during it is very different than how you feel after. And it's the same mm -hmm. thing with like working out, which I'm sure you can attest to, you know, like I, I don't know anybody. Well, maybe after you kind of get in the routine of it, you, you start to crave that workout, but I don't know anybody who's gotten done with a workout and been like, man, that workout, I hate myself for doing that workout. You know, you usually feel really good afterwards. And so how do you want to feel after? Like, how do you feel after eating that bag of chips? And if you're going to feel like shit, should you really do it? And again, I'm not perfect. I still do it every now and then, but I'm a hell of a lot better than I used to be. Yeah. I like that. I mean, I could definitely see myself taking that sticky note and crumpling it up a couple of times, but yeah, eventually I, mean. I get the point. You like curse yourself. Like, have you ever flipped yourself off in the mirror? That's what it feels like. like <laughs> fuck you, future self. Why did you make me do this? <laughs> oh, I love that. Okay. So let's talk about uh, one thing I did want to talk to you about, and I'm going to totally like just hard, hard shift gears here because this just popped into my head and it was something that I did want to chat with you about is, is money mindset and, and how much growth you have done over the last um, few years in terms of just the financial piece, right? So a lot of times um, people are scared of money. They think money is evil. They think money is bad or don't have enough money or their underlying belief is just lack. So can you kind of tell, um, tell us like what your money beliefs were growing up, what they were kind of when when we first met um, and where they're at now? Um, so when I was growing up, I kind of just blew money like it grew off of a tree. And eventually I got to the point where I was old enough to realize that that's not how money works. Um, my mom actually had to work for that. And there's only, at the time, there's only so much of it is what I believed. Um, and so I kind of stopped blowing money, but I still saw money as a limited resource. Um, you could only make so much and you could only work so much to make so much, if that makes sense. So then um, when I was out on my own for a while, 
I had the same belief. I tried to work all the time and go to school all the time and still take care of myself and my family and help all of my friends. But I was still so stressed about money because there was only so much of it. But then I'd turn around and spend it on Taco John's every other day. Um, so I really didn't have any control of it. My control and where I was was if I can pay my bill, that's all I care about. After that, it is what it is. I had like no savings. So the minute something went wrong on my car, I was like, please don't be expensive. Please don't be expensive. And, um, or just turn the radio up and ignore it. And then, um, so that was really toxic, toxic for a really long time. And then when we were working together, there was that uh, Gordon Ramsay worksheet, I think. And um, Dave Ramsey, not Dave Gordon Ramsey. Ramsey. Gordon we didn't do any food. We didn't do any cooking, so. <laughs> you can see where my mind is now that we talked about tacos. <laughs> I know, I'm like, Hell's Kitchen? Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> my friend would be so disappointed. But uh, so that one, I think I went through three months of my spending and just went through and highlighted what was like a bill what was mindless spending and what spending actually made me feel good. And going through that made me realize how much fast food and how much clothes that I never wore that I was buying. Um, and so then I knew I needed to shift because I couldn't be spending all of my money on useless crap. And so I had to figure out where I wanted to draw my spending in and where I wanted to change it. And I don't really know where I shifted, but eventually money turned into more of an energy in my mind instead of just being, there's only so much of it. And energy is like, oh, my science brain is failing me right now. But energy I know, I'm like, is it the time of day? Like, why are we so scatterbrained? Because I'm like that too. I'm like, squirrel. <laughs> and I'm sitting in the library and I see somebody walk by and I'm like, ooh, I wonder what your mask looks like. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, I never thought I'd see the day where masks are like an accessory. Like we were walking around the other day. We just got back from a vacation and uh, it was so funny because people did, they had like masks that matched their outfit. And I just looked at my husband and I was like, man, I did not think that I would see the day that like masks were an accessory to whatever like you're wearing, but crazy world that we, uh, that we live in. So that's neither here nor there. So you started to shift your money mindset. Um, you started a budget, kind of figured out that you wanted to be intentional with your money. And this probably just goes back to how you want to feel too, you know, at the end of the month, when you look at those statements and you're like, oh, hell, I spent several hundred dollars on, on things that don't make me feel good. Like, I wonder what would happen if I spent those things on something that did make me feel good, or if I put them in savings for something really big that would make me feel good. And that was kind of my big shift, honestly, um, because I looked at where all my money was going and I'm like, I don't feel good about that. And then I opened a bank account that I could not get to. Mm -hmm. Unless I physically went to that bank account during their business hours and got money out of it. Um, I remember that conversation. <laughs> I was so against that for so long. Too. I know. I know. I know. I did it. I did it too. I was like, fuck this. But then I did it and I'm like, oh, wow. I'm magically all of a sudden I'm, like, I'm acquiring money. I'm hanging on to money. It's because you have mm -hmm. to like trick yourself. It's so funny. And so I really think that's where I made my big shift. And I have three sources of income. Um, and I actually have one that goes straight there. I don't even look at my statements. Um, actually during COVID I did because that was my primary income. So I'd have to go there and bring money to my main bank. But um, I never, originally I never looked at the statements. I just put that money into that account. And so when I needed it, then I would go to the bank and be like, hey, how much do I have? And just about every single time they'd tell me more than I thought. I'm like, oh, okay. And so I started to realize that being blindsided, well, not blindsided, being blind to what's going into that account was good for me because then I couldn't see what I had. And so that made me realize that 
I'm not always, money is not something that's going to limit me all the time. It's my decisions that are limiting me. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that energy or money flow, when I believed that it would increase is when it increased. And when I, like, when I get stressed about it and start worrying about being able to pay bills, that's when I notice that it, those limiting beliefs coming back up. And that's when I notice that I feel like that energy doesn't flow as well. And so my bank account isn't going up. And so I don't know. I don't know if that even made sense, but it does. I, I mean, I feel like the listeners of this podcast are pretty into like the law of attraction and manifestation and like calling in and limiting beliefs and things of that nature. Um, and, and you know, where your energy goes, things flow. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, but if you could talk about some of your limiting beliefs, maybe some of the listeners can relate to you in, in a sense. Um, so what stories or what beliefs were, would come up for you in terms of lack and then also on the other side in terms of abundance? Um, so my lack is really easy to remember. Um, those were like, I don't have enough. I will never have enough. If I would have something that I wanted that was expensive, I'm like, there's no way I can get that because I can't even afford to pay this bill. Um, or like the feeling of being in control. I'm, I'm very big on feeling like I'm in control. And when my money is not the way I want it to be, then I immediately go to, I can't control this. Um, like I can't work enough to make enough. I can't do enough to bring the income in and I just feel all out of whack. Mm -hmm. And so then I had to switch those mind, that mindset to, um, I am abundant. Um, I'm working more than I need to, to make the income that I need. Um, uh, I don't remember. There was one that I used to write in my journal all the time and I stopped and I can't remember what it is now but it was the one that clicked the most and it was super simple, but it was basically something about being good at saving um, because I had such a mindset that I was not a saver, I was a spender. And so writing that down every day, saying that I am a saver or I am good at saving money really switched, a, like was one of my biggest shifts. I love that. I love the I am statements. They're very powerful. And, and I always tell people like, don't give up when you first start your I am statements, because you will probably be so irritated with yourself because you know that they aren't true in the beginning. And so you're like, why am I even saying this? This is just, you know, you kind of like talk yourself out of it. Like, this is so stupid, but I'm telling you just like anything else, just like those push-ups, just like mental push-ups, the more you do, the easier it gets. And then once you start to see a little bit of momentum, a little bit of progress, you're like, oh my God, it's working. And then you want to say it all the time. And then anytime a thought creeps in that could be negative or could be lack, you're like, nope, nope stop right there. I feel joy. I feel abundant. I feel wealthy. And, and you immediately start to switch it and, and catch those things. But in the beginning, it can be tough. So, I mean, what was your experience with that? Oh, it was super hard. Like I wrote it. And for a while, I literally wrote, I am good at saving. And then I was like, bullshit. And then I was like, no, that, that does not help. <laughs> not helpful. Yeah. When do you think it started to kind of click? Um, I think once I started seeing that number in the bank account that I couldn't get to rising, I realized that, that my I am statement worked. Um, and I had used I am statements for like self-love and self-care too prior to that. So like I knew it worked, but looking at it in a different aspect was so, so different. Um, it was harder to convince myself that I was a saver than it was to convince myself that I loved myself. And that can be different for everyone because we all have different blocks and limiting beliefs, but it was easier to convince myself that I loved my body and I loved myself than it was to convince myself that I could save money. And um, I don't know, looking back, I think that's so wild just because so many people struggle with self-love and self-care and so many people struggle with money that it's just, it's different to see how one person struggles with one thing more than they would struggle with the other. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I, I can agree with you on the money side of things. And even the self-love side of things, I went through a period where like I would tell myself I love myself in the mirror and I just wanted to like break the mirror, you know, mm -hmm. like I would have like these really awful thoughts of like, I'm just going to bust this mirror and then I'm going to cut my face with it or something really like awful things. Right. But then I'm like, wait a minute, stop. And then, you know, once I started to embody that self-love and then I kind of moved on to the money things after that. And it kind of started, you know, like we talked about earlier, like that alignment, that flow. And it was easier for me to say things like I am somebody who saves money or I am somebody who believes in wealth. I am a wealthy individual. Um, Money is everywhere. Money does grow on trees. Um, the more I make, the more I can give. And just these, you know, better feeling thoughts about money and how it's just an energy exchange, right? And, and not everybody with money has to be evil, just like not everybody um, with money has to be joy. I mean, I think it very much depends on the person. Sure. Um, and I don't think that money in and of itself is anything other than a tool and a resource that allows you to do the things you want in life, uh, no matter what that is. Um, and that you can always call more of it in. I think it's very, very interesting how you said that too. Like I have three revenues of income now. And when COVID happened, I was able to dip into this one over here. And I think that's another thing that people, um, don't really think about. They, one of the, the beliefs that I had is there wasn't, a, there wasn't as many hours in a day for me to make the kind of money that I wanted to do because I was very much a believer in, time equals money versus, yes. um, you know, so you, you had to be present in order to earn that dollar versus like, well, I can earn money when I sleep. Like, why not? Or, or I can make more money in one transaction than I can working 40 hours a week at a day job. You know, like mm -hmm. you just start to think about money and, and wealth differently than trading time for money. Yeah. And I think when I like, realized that that was a really big shift for me. Um, granted, I still two of my jobs are like a nine to five. And but once I actually had a money mindset shift, I enjoyed those jobs more. Like when mm -hmm. I wasn't focused on making money while I was there, I was focused on just enjoying my day. That shifted too, which I thought was oh. odd. I but. love that. <laughs> I love that. So what do you think has been the, the biggest, and we'll kind of start to wrap this up, but what do you think has been the biggest shift for you in terms of just personal growth over the last few years? Just believing in myself. I came from a place where I really didn't believe in myself. I had so many limiting beliefs. I was a huge procrastinator and just didn't think that I could easily obtain or reach the goals that I had set for myself. And once I realized that I am in control and the amount of work that I put into it is what I'm going to get back and that I can do whatever I set my mind to, um, that kind of was like the biggest shift. Yeah. I wouldn't call you a procrastinator now. <laughs> <laughs> Not even I've gotten a, a lot bit. better on that one. <laughs> I love that. Okay. So for, for the listeners here, what are your, well, before I kind of wrap up with final thoughts, like what are some tools and resources that are your favorite that have helped you and that you can recommend to our listeners? Well, your podcast, but they're already here. Um, <laughs> Keep listening. <laughs> um, as far as like podcasts that have helped me a lot, Trent Shelton's is a really good one too or um, Rachel Hollis, I love her. Just, there's, um, there is some authors that I really, really love. Just personal development books in general have helped me a lot, um, just to realize where I'm blocking myself um, and keeping myself from growth. And then um, YouTube has been really beneficial as far as meditation and like helping me work through my anxiety. Uh, and Gary John Bishop is one of my favorite authors. He's very straightforward, cusses throughout his entire books. Is he the life. one that, um, what was his most recent book? I think it was Do the Work. Okay, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of a different guy. Okay. 
I'll have to read that one. Yeah, he's got oh. three, and they're kind of in a sequence or se whatever. What are the What are the other two? Um, if you don't know, that's okay. I'm just trying to think because I'm like the name sounds familiar, but maybe I'm thinking of a different Gary. Unfuck yourself and stop yes. doing that shit. Yeah, unfuck yourself. That's the one. I'm like, I know there's one that like everybody knows. Okay. Yes. That's the one I'm thinking of. Yeah. That okay. One was so he has my favorite. And he has two others too. Yep. Stop doing okay. that shit and um do the work. Do the Stop work is more of like a do the work is more of a, like a workbook type. So okay. like I like to listen to audiobooks in the car. Listening mm -hmm. to that one in the car didn't work quite as well, but it was still very beneficial. Mm -hmm. They probably have like prompts and things like that to do along yep. the way. Yep. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. Um, awesome. I love that. Those, those are some pretty solid recommendations. I, um, I've seen Trent Shelton or Sh is it Shelton or Sheldon? Shelton. There's Shelton. He, doesn't he work with Rachel Hollis? Yeah. His, his podcast is like a Hollis co-production or something. And they said that at the end of everybody, everyone. Okay. But I'm also currently reading his book. Um, that I can't remember what it's called. We talked about it a ton in this podcast. <laughs> oh, that's too funny. Okay, I, I was gonna say I thought that they worked together at some in some capacity, but I wasn't sure what it was. So okay, no, and um, yeah, I think everybody is familiar with with Rachel Hollis. Um, so what do you want? Like, what's the number one thing you want to leave listeners with today? Keep going. Uh, just because you feel the resistance, just because you feel something pushing back doesn't mean that you need to give up. Um, it just means that you're getting closer. Um, no matter how hard it feels in the end result, it's going to feel even better when you get there. And one of my big things is self-sabotage. Uh, I feel I've like, I've done that a lot in life. And that's one of the things that I work the hardest to get past is self-sabotage because that just takes you four steps back when you're two steps forward. Um, so basically just keep pushing, just working towards what you want, switch your mindset, say those I am statements, even when they feel absolutely ridiculous, because it's those little things that are going to build up to that big thing. Absolutely. I love that. Well, Gina, we did it. We did a, we did a podcast together. How do you feel? I love it. I'm so happy. I'm so happy you did this too. And I'm, I think our listeners will, um, will get a lot out of this. I've, uh, I've been waiting for this for a really long time. So I appreciate you coming on here. I love that you shared your story. I feel like we're going to have to do a part two because when you just said like self-sabotage, I was like, son of a B, I knew there was something else that we were, we should have talked about. And I feel like we could do an entire episode on self-sabotage because this is one of the number one things that people that happens in people's lives this is one of the biggest things that like i've helped people with too because it's something that i struggled with it's you know you you start you hit that like wall and you feel like oh things are tough i can't do this or or you almost tell yourself like things are too good something's gonna go wrong and then you unconsciously create all of this chaos in your life to sabotage whatever success you were going to achieve so oh man that could take us down a whole rabbit hole but i i seriously i appreciate everything that you've shared i love watching your journey i love seeing when where you were to where you are now and i just cannot wait to see all of the things that you do i'm just i'm very happy i'm very excited for you and i'm always here cheering you on and I love that uh you're also just giving our listeners permission to to do hard things too oh I don't even have words I just I don't know I love that we finally did this even though I was so scared I don't know thanks for listening to the Sasha Davis podcast for more information on personal and professional development, we've created a master list of all of the resources discussed in the podcast and the blog. So head on over to sashadavis.com resources for our full list.